Okay, so this section we're going to, uh, since they don't have subtitles to the chapter um, and sections, I'm just going to call it the section about hegemony. Um, on 122, so after um, the little ellipsis, right, um, they talk about how this is really about power, right? And if we look at that second full paragraph, but the dominance of Amazon, iTunes, and Netflix in their respective markets means that the studios, labels, and publishers can no longer resort to one of their traditional strategies, playing retailers off of one another in negotiations. In fact, in many ways, the situation is now completely reversed. Um, and in er, and, and, and the first full paragraph, um, power tends to be concentrated in the hands of a small number of dominant players. So that's really what this is about in some sense. Power in the hands of a small number of dominant players. So the ones that they set up, right, is Amazon, Netflix, um, what was the last one? Apple, iTunes. So let's say Apple. And then you have producers over here. And what they're suggesting is that, so these, if these are the retailers, that traditionally this has been where the producers would make these retailers fight amongst themselves and cut themselves the better deal since they're going to compete, right? To tr try and, uh, to, to nag, nab um, uh, uh, an exclusive contract, right? But in this case, because they're all, at least at this point in history, right? We know that they're all kind of competing now. They're, they're so dominant in their respective domains, they're the ones that actually have the power. So the shift kind of happens this way, right? Instead of it used to be this way. And so now the producers are the ones that are competing amongst themselves. So this shift, you know, from producers to the streaming platforms, this is this is really what um, the bread and butter, um, it, or, or, or you know, uh, what what the chapter is about. So they talk about Amazon, and this is still early on when Amazon um, is is not what it is today. Um, for those of you who do remember, but when it was still primarily about books, but. Uh, on Tuesday, I had mentioned the sort of importance of rhetoric and targeting. Well, I've been mentioning the, the importance of rhetoric all semester. So in this case, um, what I want to kind of draw your attention to is this idea of the Gazelle Project. Bezos is the Gazelle Project. What is the Gazelle Project? This is 123. About uh, a third down. It's an approach or just Jeff Bezos's recommendation, so it's it's basically a mandate from the CEO and founder and creator that this is the, the kind of character of the company in relation to its providers, so small publishers, right, who, who need to get their product on Amazon, right, that they approach them in a way that a cheetah would pursue a sickly gazelle. So Am Amazon equals cheetah, Small publishers um, equals not just a gazelle, but a sickly gazelle. Right. Um, squeeze publishers that have nowhere else to turn. So you trap them, you corner them, and then um, you make their lives even more difficult until they have nothing to do but concede because where the small publishers are going to go, Amazon is the only store in town, or, or the only game in town. But if we look at this actual relationship, like what is Bezos himself, in saying that we are, like this is the Gazelle Project, what is he actually acknowledging and confessing to in terms of like what the company is? I mean, what is a cheetah? Yeah, it's a majestic big cat. It's also a predator. Gazelle is prey. So when we talk about predatory practices, this is basically, at least early on, and, and you be the judge of if, if this is happening or not, although I just saw a story about how price gouging is happening, not just on the sellers on Amazon, but Amazon itself is starting to, to kind of capitalize on the moment. Um, but yeah, what does it say about the company, right? Um, now, 
to, to go back to kind of the importance of rhetoric, so how, why and how do the lawyers intervene? Um, because the lawyers know, like, this is just not something that you want to be putting out there in terms of your, your corporate practices, right? So what do they change it to? Um, this is still 123. Where is it? Ah, although Amazon's lawyers later changed the name to the less provocative small publishers negotiation problem pro, um, uh, program. Now, I just want to kind of write this out so we can appreciate the sort of full gamut or the full scope of this, but um, small publishers negotiation program. And we know that this is how rhetoric works. Still the same business relationship and practices, still thinking about small publishers in a particular way, very, very different language, right? Um, similarly, Dennis Johnson, the co-owner of a small publisher, Melville House, said in a 2014 uh, news article, well, for one, think about this. The, on 123, this is the first full paragraph. What Smith and Talon say is, there, that was too much for one small publisher. Dennis Johnson, the co-owner of Melville House, decided to stand up to the bully. Even they're acknowledging that Amazon is basically bullying in this situation, right? But at the bottom, um, in, in, in an interview with the New York Times, Johnson, Dennis Johnson says, how is this not extortion, right? Perfectly legal, by the way, but how is it not extortion? What, what makes this not a terrible practice? You know, the thing that is illegal when the mafia does it. Is it just legal, according to Dennis Johnson, right? Is it just legal because Amazon does it? Well, this goes back to, again, we're not just talking about business relations. We're not just talking about, you know, um, how, how Amazon becomes, you know, um, uh, uh, as successful as it does, and, and Bezos as well, but we are talking about power, right? We are talking about hegemony, right? We are talking about um, small publishers being squeezed by, by the major force in retail, right? And the much more forceful language in this case, right, is extortion. It's not, it's not, you know, um, uh, Johnson isn't mincing words about it in any way, right? Um, on 124 also, oh, so this is the next page. I want to kind of bring up the sort of, the relationship, because Johnson still has to go along with it, right? Melville still, even though he's being extorted, he's agreeing to the extortion, right? He doesn't say, you know, like, um, uh, uh, after, after Amazon, um, you know, kind of, um, pull, pulls uh, uh, their product, Melville House product, he has to kind of acquiesce and, and concede, right? And that's the crucial dim dimension of he hegemony. Even though Johnson himself is saying he's being extorted, he goes along with it. He feels that he has no real choice. And so this idea, right, that Smith and Taylong bring up as well, but the idea of like the lesser of two evils, or even the, like the necessary evils, or the necessary evil, right? Um, this is Philip Jones on 124, at the end of the first full paragraph. The editor of the trade magazine. The worst thing that could happen to book publishers would be for Amazon to go away, he told the BBC. The second worst thing would be for it to become more dominant. So like, think about, again, when we talk about these kind of like, weird, contradictory relationships. Think about this kind of double bind where it's like the worst thing is, is no Amazon. The second worst thing is a stronger Amazon. These seem to kind of be in conflict with one another, but somehow the suggestion is, is that like, you know, working with Amazon is in fact terrible, but it's still better than there not being an Amazon, right? So there's a concession that's happening, right? Now, on 124, part of the reason that, that, that producers have to concede to a platform like, uh, like Amazon, right, 
um, is at the very bottom valuable exposure for content so you have to get your stuff on Amazon in order for people to see it but also more importantly market information about who is buying the content it's the affordance of a platform like Netflix or an Amazon where if I get my show or my book on Amazon or Netflix it's not just that I'm giving them getting access to that market but also the promises right is that they're going to give me data right data on who's buying my product right which will give me better idea of how to further tailor the product which goes back to this question of targeting right but just wanted to kind of emphasize that again it comes back to the issue of user data right and then finally just want to point out um, on 126 so this is the most recent data on the table, 8.1, is 2015, but it's kind of astonishing. We all know this is kind of happening, right? Um, this is kind of astonishing, right? In the sense that the shift from brick and mortar to internet retailers, right? And yeah, again, because this is something that we benefit from for the most part, you know, I buy so much stuff on Amazon myself that you think, well, like, that's just natural. Amazon is just better. But it's like, and so, it, it, you know, it, it's, but it's easy to think that way, but we have, we don't have a full range of, like, what that means, right? So it's like, you know, we have to kind of, kind of think very carefully about the, the, the kind of, you know, the entire, the, the big picture, right? Um, you know, for one, it's like, well, what is it, what is it? what happens when, um, you know, um, power shifts to this degree, but also, like, our current moment, you know, gives a sense of, yeah, like, we might, we love the internet and all, but it's, like, um, uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, clearly, it's, like, internet retailers um, have their own, their limits, right, and, and the, 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 like, the absolute importance of, of brick and mortar, um, I'm thinking of something like Canterford right now. It's like it's, it's becoming so clearly, you know, obvious that that this relationship is is, is something that's much more tenuous, and, and we've we taken for granted, right? Like again, the sort of promises of of the digital utopia. Okay, so let's move on.